Hello everyone and welcome to the very first instalment of our virtual show live. I'm so happy to be presenting this week coming up. Uh, everyone here at Cambrian has been working so, so hard uh, to get uh, this show up and running. And we're really looking forward to sort of offering all these uh, speakers that we've got coming up uh, over this next week. It's gonna be super exciting. Uh, really looking forward uh, to, to doing this with everyone. Uh, we've got some views already, which is uh, which is nice to see. Uh, let me know if you're watching live, uh, comment live. Uh, we, we like to know that you're actually watching. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, yes, so our show starts today. Uh, we're super excited to, to actually do this for you. Uh, really looking forward to, to doing it uh, myself as well. Uh, today, uh, we've got a very special day for you. So, uh, Beard's, <laughs> Beard's looking amazing. I like that. I like it. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, looking forward to today. Uh, we've got uh, our first installment, which we'll be inviting in a second, is uh, Rob and Sharon. Uh, they're going to be doing some stuff in Photoshop and showing off their skills within there. Uh, later on today, we've got Gary Jones at 3 p.m. who'll be doing a, uh, if you want to become a wildlife photographer talk, which is going to be absolutely amazing. And then this evening, uh, we've got Alan Wallace coming in talking about his uh, astrophotography. So really looking forward to those coming up as well. So uh, yeah, watching live from Scotland, hello. Uh, Yes, thanks for putting it all together. That's that's brilliant. Thank you for your comments. Uh, yes, so uh, without further ado, I'd uh, adieu. I do this with words, so it's going to happen. I always get my words mixed up, so see how we go. Uh, yeah, without further ado, we're we going to uh, in invite Rob and Sharon in, our first speakers, kicking off the show. Uh, let's invite them in. Hi, Rob. Hello. Hi, Hi. Sharon. Hello. Hello. Uh, Please make our guests feel uh, nice and welcome. So the, uh, uh, the the watches are coming in. So let us know that uh, that, that you're there. Uh, well, I'm in the dark. Comment. You're in the dark. <laughs> I am, yeah, because I'm going to do some live photoshopping, and it was too bright, so I had to close all the curtains and put a little light on. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm so in the room. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you are actually in 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 the same building, aren't We're you? The same <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get as far away from Sharon. It's never happened before. <laughs> I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dearie me, dearie me. Uh, yeah. So, uh, oh, oh. So, Rob's your warm up act. I'm it? I'm the warm up act. Um, uh, I'll I'll probably talk for about half an hour to quarters of an hour. Um, I haven't timed it precisely, but say about forty minutes. Um, yeah. And I suspect we'll have a, a short break. We'll look at some of the comments, maybe answer some of them, and then um, Sharon will kick off with the main bit of the show. I'm just <laughs> really get the crowd warming. I know my place. <laughs> Fingers oh, crossed. Oh, that works. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure it will be. So yeah. Um, yeah, thank you ever so much for joining uh, in. Uh, it's it's lovely to have you and kicking off the show as well. So, uh, so thank you very much for that, guys. Um, yeah, I, I think we should just jump straight into it, Rob. If if you're ready to go, oh, sure. Yeah, okay. that's that's brilliant. So um, we'll 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 see you later. Uh, see you later on, Sharon. Uh, so we'll just uh, we'll pop you out the way. There we go. Rob's a little bit happier now. We're shouting yeah. out the way. <laughs> I can't. As ever, I'm sure she can hear me, even if I can't see her. Oh just... yeah, no, she can definitely hear you. So uh, you. you trust me. I'll I'll hand over to you, Rob. So um, off right. off you go. <laughs> okay. So what what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute, um, and I'm going to go through a little bit of a wandering introduction to composite photography. So the, the title of this is The Art of Composite Photography. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how I got into it, and more particularly, how I discovered Photoshop. I've never had a lesson in Photoshop. I've never had any formal instruction. I kind of picked it up as I went along, mainly initially by the CDs and DVDs that came at the back of photograph magazines. I was kind of keenly uh, watching them. And then more lately through YouTube, 
Um, when I started, there wasn't as much content on YouTube about Photoshop as there is now. So I almost exclusively go to YouTube for anything I want to know now. But back then, it was these CDs and DVDs, as I say. Um, and if I share my screen with you now, fingers crossed this will work. Yeah. Um, what I realized is as I was learning Photoshop, I was also learning how to do composite photography. Um, and the uh, strange case of the wheelie bins refers to a friend of mine, but maybe 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago, set up a website for fun that was quite fun, which was called Where Have You Wheelie Been? And the idea behind this website was that anyone who went on holidays would take a photograph of a wheelie bin on holidays and then send that photograph back to, to uh, the website. And we'd all see what wheelie bins looked like in foreign countries, which is kind of vaguely amusing for a very short time. And I decided I'd gently rib them um, by buying postcards and seeing if I could Photoshop into these postcards um, photographs of wheelie bins. Very quickly decided I couldn't get my hands on enough um, postcards. But what would happen if I used famous photographs and image and posters and stuff and started putting photographs of wheelie bins into those original images? And that's really how this started. So this dates it. This is around the time of uh, Batman Begins. And I thought to myself, I wonder what that would look like if we added a bin, like what is Batman looking into? So I did that. And that was simply me going outside, taking a photograph of my wheelie bin. But to get it into the poster, I had to learn how to use the transform tool to change its size. And I had to learn how to use the levels tool to make it completely black to match the silhouette of Batman. And people seem to really like it. They found it really funny. Um, so I was on a bit of a roll there. And I was thinking, OK, so what other um, images could I start playing with? And this was the next one I did. And again, I started kind of working out, well, how do I, how do I get shadows to match the original shadows in the Yojima photograph? And I started trying to discover how to use shadows. Um, and that was fun. And kind of off we went. Very soon, I was starting to put wheelie bins into any photograph I could find and posting it up on the website. Um, and gradually, people started sending me emails and going, this is fantastic. Please, can you do one next week? Please, can you do one um, on this photograph? And they were suggesting ideas. So I rapidly started learning Photoshop through trying to get these photographs of wheelie bins, bizarre as it sounds, into these photographs. And I was learning composite photography kind of without noticing. So if we take this one, this is for the, the punk rockers out there. In order to make this image add that wheelie bin, I had to look at perspective very carefully. I couldn't take a straight shot of the bin because it wouldn't fit. I had to um, learn Gaussian blur to get the blurred effect to try and match the original photograph. I had to use um, digital noise to try and match the film grain that was within the um, uh, original photograph and so on. And almost without effort, and certainly without any hardship, I was learning more and more and more about Photoshop while just kind of playing and enjoying myself and having fun. And of course, that's the best way to learn. Um, and they just kind of followed on. This was an interesting one, actually, because um, I had a dilemma about where to put shadows. So the original photograph that that must have been based on, the light source would have been coming from the right-hand side. But in post-production, they decided, I'm guessing, to put the main light coming from the girl's bedroom. But they didn't bother changing the shadows on the man standing there or the um, lamppost. So my dilemma was, do I put the shadows where they would be if that was a real photograph? Or am I going to match the shadows in the existing um, photograph as it looks now. And that again made me have to research shadows and where they go. In fact, I went with the matching of the original. But I'm kind of quietly learning an awful lot of stuff about Photoshop as I'm doing this. How to change color, for instance. Um, Jimmy didn't have a black bin behind him. He decided, I decided green would be good. It would go with the yellow that was already there. So I'm learning how to change color. 
And the, the next one is interesting because it's, it's a mistake. And I think it's good to learn. I think I probably learn more from the mistakes I make than the successes I have. So that really been doesn't work. I look at it now and think, Rob, what were you doing? Um, the perspective is wrong. It's too small. Um, but more particularly, again, shadows being very important, I think, in composites, the shadow is dead wrong. If you look at the sh natural shadows underneath um, Art Garfunkel's feet or Paul Simon's feet, they're really, really soft. That was clearly a cloudy, soft day, as we'd say in Ireland. Um, but I put in a shadow on that bin that's very harsh and was obviously taken in sunlight. And if that was a composite photograph that I was showing now, it would clearly not work because I haven't taken the time to match the shadows in one bit of the composite with the shadows in another bit. And then I was kind of having fun. So um, the idea of um, the cabinet war papers at the Yalta summit resting on top of a wheelie bit just amused me. Um, and again, I was trying to see if I could get Churchill's elbow resting on the wheelie bin. So it involves selecting and coming out and a bit of masking. Again, I'm learning as I'm doing. And by the time I got to the end, um, I was kind of combining all the skills that I picked up from these DVDs into something like this. Um, and that was the kind of pinnacle of my messing around with wheelie bins, really. Um, there's different shades of green on that bin. And the, the color palette decision to make it green so it stood out. Um, uh, I deliberately didn't want to make it blue or amber or yellow. Um, so. If I was going to do that, then I was going to have to match the color in the sky somehow to be on the top of the bin so that um, it would look like light was reflecting off the top. Um, I had to do a little bit of shading on the side. I had to use the texture to get that kind of bubbly effect. And without really any effort, I had kind of vaguely worked out quite a number of composite photography skills while learning Photoshop. That was kind of useful. So that's how I got into um, Photoshop generally and composites uh, more particularly. And I suspect I'm the only person who learned Photoshop through wheelie bins. I may have the, um, the status of being the only person who's ever done that. So what I want to do now is I want to move on and I want to look at a, a, a composite photograph and unpack it a little bit. Sharon will do more of this in the second half and she'll do it live, which is extremely brave of her. I'm using PowerPoint here. Um, so if I look at this um, importance of light direction, the, the, that's one of the key things for me for um, a composite. You're, you're combining images taken at two separate times. So one of the key things to get right, I think, is getting the light direction um, correct in both images. So that's an image called The Hustle, which I took a while ago. And I'm going to unpack that image uh, to show you the kind of thinking that I went into when I was taking it and making it, and also some of the skills about light direction. So I'll first of all show you where it was taken, the background. It's quite important, I think, to, to see backgrounds. Sometimes as a composite photographer, you walk around and you notice the backgrounds um, that you wouldn't normally have taken photographs of. So this is Whitefriars in Chester. It's just um, at the bottom of Bridge Street before, before it becomes Lower Bridge Street. Um, and I've done a little bit of sketching here. Sharon finds this hilarious um, to try and show you how this was set up. So that's me doodling with a pen and some red ink in Photoshop. Um, so that's me on the right taking the photograph. There were the two guys leaning up against a red brick wall on the right, just beside Cafe Euros, and that's where the softbox, single speed light in a softbox. I'm just noticing with my own drawing, my softbox appears to be growing branches at the moment. I have no idea why it's doing that or how I managed to get that effect. But that's giving you an idea of um, where it was taken and kind of how it was taken. And that was the initial image. So there's the two guys there, but I realized once I'd taken it that it would look quite good if there was a third person there um, and, and probably a female. So I um, decided what I was going to do is I needed a little bit more space on the right of the image. So I expanded it with um, canvas size on Photoshop and gave myself a little bit more space to the right. And then if I can point at my cursor, I basically copy and paste um, up here. 
So you can see what would be called cloning errors if I'd left them. Even those two black bits there are repeated there. They're repeated there. Um, there's also this quite bad line here which shows the depth of field I was using. Just as it happens, deliberately I was shooting on F5 to make the background blurred enough, but to get the two guys um, in focus from the back of the shoulder of one to the front of the nose of the other. Um, now that's an interesting thing because if you're going to shoot composites, you probably need to remember some of the settings you had in the first um, photograph if you're going to paste something in from another photograph or else they don't fit as well. So I remember that was F5 and um, that was chosen for the depth of field issues. Okay, but I'm thinking I might use this to represent the 1940s or the 1950s as a kind of Sam Spade look with some of those um, hats. And I don't want to be constrained with a particular time era, but of course there are elements in that photograph that make it look modern. So for instance, there's a for sale sign there, and I'm already thinking that needs to go. I'm gonna to have to get rid of that. Um, probably using the clone tool or the patch tool. There's an alarm there that happens to be yellow. Now I may go monochrome on this. In fact, I did in the end, but that's going to have to go anyway. Clearly there's double yellow lines. They're going to have to go. Um, and I know that at the point of taking it, um, the sky is bleached out. I would sometimes use a new layer and I'd use a dodge and burn tool, the uh, dodge tool particularly. Uh, sorry, burnt in particular to bring out um, cloud detail. But in fact, there's no detail at all in that sky. So to make it interesting, even at the taking stage, I'm thinking I'm going to put another sky in there. Um, the one thing I didn't do, and I wish I had done, uh, and I only noticed it afterwards, if I can use my cursor to show you there's a little spot of light just above this hat there. If I'd only moved a nim to the right, a centimeter would have done it. Um, it would have saved that little thing, which I didn't notice at the time, but now constantly irritates me. Of course, I could um, clone it out now, but sometimes leaving your mistakes in keeps you humble. And um, that's something my eye is drawn to every time. The other thing about um, this image is that it's, um, it's full of diagonals. Um, so there's a diagonal here leading to the center. There's one here. There's the bricks. I would love to claim I was photographically skilled enough to have that in my mind at the time I took the photograph. It's just a complete accident, a lucky accident. Um, and every now and then I'm tempted to go, no, 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 that was completely deliberate, but people would see through that it wasn't. <laughs> what is deliberate though is um, if we look at their eyes, if I take a line, a diagonal line um, between the, say the center of Martin's eyes there, that's Martin Riley and his brother, and join it. If I'm gonna paste into that space, it would be really good if the eyes of the woman is on that diagonal line. So that is deliberate. I'm, I'm, I've deliberately got in my mind where that line is going, and that's where I'm going to end up with the next image. So already I'm quite constrained in terms of what I'm going to do if I take another photograph. I'm constrained by the F uh, stop, the aperture at F5. I'm constrained by where the eyes are going to go. So I'm, um, I've got a number of things already, but more particularly, what's crucially important for me is the light direction. And I, can, I, I knew where the softbox was, um, but to check light direction, there's nothing better than looking at the catch lights in people's eyes. So there they are. If that was a, a clock face, um, about 10 o'clock is where the catch lights are. So that will help me both position my softbox for a, another shoot and to check it afterwards. And that's what it is. So fast forward a couple of months. And this is Lizette, friend of my daughter's. And she's round in our house. We have a, a home studio um, that we've made and we take most of our photographs at home now. But this was just outside. Um, and I've set up um, Lizette around the back of our house where there happens to be a brick wall. And I'm trying to replicate as much as possible the lighting conditions from the first shoot. So one of the first things is, um, as I say, I'm constrained by a number of things. I'm going to have to shoot at F5 to match the depth of field 
um, because I, I, I needed that F5 to throw the uh, street out of focus. So I'm, I want to keep that here. Um, the shutter speed doesn't matter that much because I'm not that concerned about ambient light. Um, in fact, I've got a black curtain um, held up behind Lucette. That's my daughter actually holding up the curtain. Um, so the uh, shutter speed doesn't matter. I'm going to leave it at 1 over 200. Um, I can't control the amount of flash falling on her face with the aperture because I'm sticking that at F5, and I can't move the, the softbox any further away from her because I'll be in the neighbor's hedges. So all I've got is to play with is the intensity of light coming out of the flash gun, and then I'm, uh, that's the duration of the flash, and that's my only variable I can play with. So I took a few. That's the one I ended up using, um, and... What I'm going to do, and Sharon and I often laugh uh, about my laziness about selecting, is r there's all kinds of hairs and, and fur and stuff there. I'm not going to bother selecting those in the, the way Sharon does, which is really brilliant and, and very, very carefully. I'm very lazy. I will stick black behind someone if I possibly can, and I'm going to cut around the black and the hairs and stick those in if I can possibly get away with it. And more particularly, I'm looking at the light direction. I'm looking at the eyes, zooming in to check that the um, light direction, again, if that's a, a clock, that's about 10 o'clock. So I'm pretty sure that image is going to fit with the next one fairly well. And that's the completed um, hustle, the completed image. Um, you can see the... Um, bits that I've removed, there's the new sky. I've added a texture to give it that kind of grungy, grainy look. And Lizette has been pasted here. Um, have I managed to do the diagonal line pretty much? But then that's not that's not that um, impressive or surprising because I deliberately placed her on that line we talked about earlier. And you can see here, and this is the bit where, where, where Sharon and I, um, or where Sharon has a go at me. So I've just taken the black here and paste it there, no effort. I've done the same there, I've done the same there, but I forgot to tidy this up. And I could pretend to <laughs> get rid of it now, but I've cut across that button completely. There's a really ugly line going down there where I didn't cut it out properly. And um, I leave it in so it gives Sharon some ammunition to have a go at me, because what would she have a go at me otherwise? And there's that irritating bit again, that just is, it's, it's always going to be there for me. And that was just, if only I had moved slightly to the right when I was taking the photograph. Okay, so that's the second bit um, done. And that's me talking about um, lighting direction and a bit of composition, but, but not much. So the final section I want to talk about is um, developing a kind of style in my, in my composite photography. Um, it's important, I think, that Sharon and I don't make the same kind of photographs. So um, my style is a little bit different to Sharon's, and I take my inspiration a lot from traditional art. So when I first joined a camera club, um, here, here's one of my, the kind of images that illustrates what I'm talking about. Here's one of my um, uh, taking inspiration from art kind of photographs. In particular, I really love the, uh, the Dutch masters, the golden age of the Dutch Renaissance. 1600 to 1700, Rembrandt, Vermeer, that kind of period. I really take a lot of inspiration from, from that, from my photography. When we first joined camera clubs, we would hear things like judges would come around and say, you shouldn't have a light source in your image because often uh, it, it'll be the brightest part of an image and it will direct the viewer's eyes away from what you want them to look at. And they will focus on the light source, and that's an error. Um, and the other thing, very, very useful thing we heard when we first heard judges talking, which has stayed with me forever, I think, is it's your job as a photographer to direct the eye gaze of your viewer. Um, wherever the viewer is going to look, you should have manipulated that gaze with your photograph. So you're saying, I want you to look here first. I want you then to look here. This is primary. This is secondary. And therefore, what you don't want them to do is look at the light source. But I was a bit dubious about it because I'd already had an interest in this kind of artwork from the um, 17th century. And it was very common for artists to deliberately put a light source in their paintings and managed to um, 
work out light and shade so carefully that the intensity of the light was not dominating the image. In fact, it was enhancing it. Um, there's an example. You could learn an awful lot about light and shade by just spending time looking at a photograph like that. And of course, there's a big candle in the foreground. But for some reason, it doesn't dominate. It adds. And as a photographer, I'm going, how do they do that? What, what's the skills they're using to do that? Here's another one. And there's there's many, many, many. I mean, I could bore you with kind of slideshow after slideshow of, of um, Dutch Renaissance paintings that include candles. So I started trying to um, replicate that in photography. That's a photograph called Last Round. It's, it's my mate James um, as the model. And deliberately, the background is a complementary color to the candle. It's, it's dark blue. It's actually Kilmain and Jail in Dublin. Um, James was lit by actually a Felix window in that case, rather than an artificial light. Um, I've, I've very, very rarely managed to light my models using a candle or a lantern itself. Uh, there isn't enough light. And if there was, I'd have such a slow shutter speed or such a high I, I, ISO that either the, there'd be an awful lot of uh, digital noise from the ISO or the model would have moved slightly by the time there was enough light hitting their face. So I tend to have to composite the, that in afterwards. And I'll show you about a little bit about that in a minute. Um, here's um, the beautiful Ellie from uh, Hollyhead. We use Ellie a lot as a model. Um, that um, candle and lantern was composited in afterwards. She was actually lit in that case. She was in Newbury Beach. She was lit by a rotor light um, on low power um, on a monopod. Um, pointing down at her face. Um, that's one, again, from her home studio, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. That was one of the rare ones where she was actually lit by that candle um, and it just worked away, it worked it out. We've, um, we've since moved away, as I say, from lighting directly from the candle. It's much easier to um, post-process it. That's Graham Curry um, holding a candlestick where the candle was added afterwards that Graham taken in, in this very room I'm talking in, actually. Um, that's Graham again uh, in the lounge studio. Um, the compositing there is the candle and the um, smoke trail coming out of the pipe. But I'll just unpack one of these images to show you the kind of stuff that goes into it. I'll deconstruct it. Um, that's called the uh, night watch, I think, is it? Last rounds was the other one. So that's the night watch, yeah, yeah. So the first thing to point out is there's a kind of implied moonlight in that photograph. So a, a light source that's hidden is another part. I'll talk about that in a second of those medieval paintings. They, they do a little bit of hidden light source stuff. Um, that's how that was taken in its original. And as you can see, it's taken in broad daylight. Um, there's a couple of interesting things in that photograph. First is my voice activated light stand. You can see her there on the left, holding the Rotolite EOS. Um, what's fabulous about the Rotolites is you can change the color temperature on the back. So that's deliberately on its warmest um, so that it'll look like a candle afterwards. As I say, I almost always have to post process the candle in later. The other thing to note just in passing is here, there is a fold up last light background, which I purchased from the wonderful Cambrian photography, where Phil Milton assured me these things are easy to fold up and put away um, after you finish with them. And that was Phil's assurance. And my assurance is I don't swear. And both of those comments are untrue. Okay, so that's, um, you'll notice daylight, um taken but with artificial light added that's the background that's Greganog hall in near newtown in palace and what particularly interested me about that i went out deliberately at night um about an hour after sunset just to get the last of the blue hour there i was particularly interested in the way light was coming through the windows so i cut and pasted some of those into the background um the light source itself, the candle, is a, a friend, that's in a friend's garden um, one night with a lantern. 
um, slow shutter speed, high ISO doesn't matter then. Um, I'm just using enough of a shutter speed to capture the candle, but it's a little soft, but that's okay um, because candles look like that. Um, and putting it all together, that's the, um, the, the final composite. So as I say, there's, there's a moon somewhere in the sky, or the implication is there's a moon somewhere in the sky. It's actually daylight now that you know. Um, and it's a hidden light source. And that's the final thing, uh, thing I want to talk about, um, is the use of a hidden light source in images. If we go back to the um, photography based on art that I was talking about earlier, um, a slightly harder challenge is this hidden light source. So if we look at that painting, that, it's amazing to think that's 400 years old or, or almost 400 years old. And go back to that point about it's your job to direct the gaze of the viewer and ask, where does your gaze first go when you see that painting? Clearly, you're being directed by the artist to look at a particular spot, shall we say, in that painting. And the light source is really interesting. There, if there was that much light, the original candle would be too bright. It would draw your eye. It would uh, bleach out, if you like, in photography terms, um, the section of the photograph. So the um, Dutch artists manage this notion of a hidden light source in their images. And there's lots and lots of them. Again, the candle there is just visible on the left, but its effects are visible. And do you need to learn anything else about light and shade than simply look at a painting like that? Or that one. Again, the candle is covered. I decided, and this is the last thing I'll talk about, that a slightly more interesting challenge, a slightly harder challenge for me, would be to try and replicate hidden light source artistry in my composite photography. So I'm about to show you some of the photographs I've taken um, with that in mind just before I finish. So there's the, the lovely Renesmee, um, that's called Reading by Candlelight. So again, there is a candle in that photograph, but you can't see it. And I'm using all my composite skills to try and make that happen. She's actually lit by a torch, which is inside that book. And she's holding a candle stick, but there is no actual live candle near her face. There's another one, similar kind of technique. Um, I decided I'd go a little bit mad with the next one and challenge myself to have both a hidden light source and a visible light source in the same photograph. And that's that one. And the final um, photograph I'll show you from my section before we finish is one I've just finished this week. Um, and it's, a, it's a, an interpretation of Van Gogh's famous painting, The Potato Eaters. Um, but the challenge was to have a hidden light source that lights more than one model in the same photograph and and here it is so there is no actual light source visible in that photograph all we can see are the effects of the light and it, it brings together many many of the things i've been talking about um, this morning. So there's compositionally, there's all the diagonals we, we saw in Hustle. Um, there's the reflection of light from a point that's there. Um, it's a composite where many of the elements were taken on separate occasions. So I have to be very careful about where my tripod is in relation to the table. Each time somebody else comes around to the house for a photograph, it has to be set up the same way. There are various members of Conway Camera Club and that that's Dave Williams there and uh, He's also there with a dodgy looking moustache. That's Sharon there. That's Ali. Um, that's Peter King with his um, back to us with the light in front of him. And that wasn't taken at home. That one is a, is a Con Conway Camera Club special interest group evening, actually. And that's Georgina who came around um, separately to all of these people. So the compositing skill, if you like, is putting all those individual components together to give the impression that they were all taken at the same time. 
um, with the added challenge of a hidden light source just to keep things <laughs> interesting and spicy. Um, and that's what I will, I will finish with, um, just that, that uh, example of multiple photographs taken on different occasions pulled together. That to me is what composite photography is. So I will stop sharing my screen now um, and go back over to Paul, if you'd like, um, and suggest we have a, a break there, Paul. That's it. Yeah, that's that's absolutely amazing. Um, I've been working on this pun while I've been watching it. Go that's on. We really been amazing. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's worthy of you, Paul. Really been amazing. I'll, I'll take that. That's fine. Okay, so oh, that's you, brilliant. We just suggest that people go stretch their legs and and come back in two or three minutes. Or what do you want to do? Yeah, we're gonna have a gonna have a two three minute break. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll drop you back off. Uh, when Rob comes back in, uh, he'll be answering some of the questions that we put into the comments. Uh, so please feel free to put in some of your uh, comments um, down there. We already have a, a couple. We will bring them up onto the screen so you'll be able to see uh, some of the. Uh, some of the questions that Rob will be answering as well. Um, just in, in the meantime as well, uh, just to talk a little bit more about the show, our virtual show that we've been arranging. Uh, so normally uh, on uh, the bank holiday uh, weekends that we have in May, normally we have our, our photographic annual show uh, in in the shop, uh, obviously, under these circumstances, we were unable to do this. So, uh, rather than not doing the show, we went the opposite way and decided to do a week long show virtually, uh, where we've got lots and lots of speakers uh, coming uh, coming throughout the week. Uh, we're trying to get sort of free a day, so uh, we're hoping to sort of fill some of the other slots that we've uh, we've got empty as well. But uh, uh, all being well, we're going to be delivering. Uh, free talk today to you. Uh, some of them are going to be demonstrations from some of the manufacturers and some of them are going to be uh, amazing talks as we've just seen from uh, Rob as well. So um, later on today we have Gary Jones that's going to be coming in talking about uh, if you want to be a wildlife photographer and then later on this evening uh, we've got alan wallace talking about uh, his astrophotography so uh, really looking forward to that also we've got some deals that are going to be happening throughout the show uh, anyone that is familiar with the show uh, we always have uh, we always have deals on the show uh, we're going to be doing those as well uh, if you go to our uh, website which is cambrianphoto.co.uk click on the uh, virtual show link that's on the top of the page. You'll also be able to see uh, the deals that are on there and some of the uh, s some more of the speakers that we've got lining up as well. That's probably the best place to go and see uh, what's actually uh, what's actually coming up. So um, yeah, no, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, let's read some of the comments uh, that we've got coming out. So yeah, we've got a couple of questions coming through. I think Rob's gonna pick some of those out in a second. Nice little comment from uh, uh, Snowden Curtis there. Uh, great first talk, sets, uh, sets the pace, yeah, brilliant. So we've got a couple of uh, couple of questions coming through. I can see uh, I get a sort of background stage that's going on in in the background as well. So I'll I'll just wait for a little sort of nod from Rob uh, when he's actually uh, ready to uh, uh, to do some of these questions for us. Um, Uh, lots of people tuning in live uh, from Facebook and YouTube. So we're, we're streaming to both platforms. Uh, you can find us on our Facebook page. 
Uh, all you need to search for is Cambrian Photography. And if you uh, want to find us on YouTube, uh, you just search for Cambrian Photo. So you can find us both on those platforms. Uh, alternatively, you can go to uh, our website, which is www.cambrianphoto.co.uk. Click on the virtual show and all of the talks are on there with links to our Facebook page uh, and our uh, YouTube page as well. So looking forward to that. Okay, let's bring, I tell you what, let's bring in, uh, let's bring back in Rob and uh, we'll also bring in Sharon as well. So she's not left out. <laughs> I was really tempted to run into the back garden and photobombing by jumping up and down behind him. That's oh, really you, you should have done. Somebody who's about you to should have done. Sharon, and a <laughs> given that you're just on. A um, couple of questions come up, and I'll, I'll answer them very quickly. Eddie Kokosa has made me laugh. I don't know if people could see Eddie's comments. He said, we've got something in common with wheelie bins. Rob, you put wheelie bins in your photographs, and I put my photographs in the wheelie bin. <laughs> it's very modest. Eddie Kokosa is a fantastic composite photographer. I really love his stuff. So so thank you for, for joining us, Eddie. Um, a couple of people have said, um, do I sketch out my images in advance um, before I pull them together? And sometimes I have to do that. I get a pen and paper and do a rough sketch of how I'd like the images to work as a single unit at the end. Um, I, I need to do that sometimes. I, don't, I haven't got a very good visual imagination. I can't see it in my head. So I do actually draw out roughly with my stick. And you've seen how, how clever my drawing is by seeing my branching um, uh, softbox tripod. <laughs> so it's about that standard. But yeah, I do sometimes need to, to do that. Um, sometimes one, uh, sorry, one of the other questions somebody asked was, um, do we have a set archive of backgrounds? And yes, uh, but but it's not so much as formal as an archive. Almost anywhere Sharon and I go with our cameras, we will randomly take photographs that you wouldn't take, I think, if you weren't a composite photographer, because you think that might look really well in a composite at some stage in the future. And it just means we have to be pretty careful about archiving our stuff so we can find something. Um, was there a doorway in a castle somewhere that we could put that model in? We've got to be able to find the castle and the doorway in you know, thousands of photographs on hard drives. So we, we catalog pretty carefully, I think. Um, Sometimes, however, the we we will see a background and it'll it'll go it'll trigger something in our minds to go that would make a great composite, and then we go out specifically to shoot a model, say, to fit right. Okay, we're ready. Yeah. Um, or the lights direction on the model. The light, you can sometimes see. Well, there's one photograph of my daughter early on where she, we were in um, uh, Liverpool Cathedral and the light rays happened to come through at a beautiful 45 degree angle. And I just got her to, to stand or kneel actually in the rays and that became a photograph. And it was prompted simply by being in a, in a background, if you like. Yeah. Hey. Um, That's brilliant. Shall we hand over to Sharon then? And I'll I, I think it's, moment. yeah, I think it's time. So Sharon, you're going to give us, uh, Rob, that was absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, it was, lovely seeing how you how you put them together and uh yeah those those wheelie bins absolutely amazing <laughs> we had lots of uh uh lots of ha ha comments coming through there so that's absolutely brilliant uh yeah so sharon you're going to give us a uh you're going to give us a live demonstration uh now and uh, uh put some put something together for us aren't you so uh, we'll, we'll say we'll say we'll say bye to rob for now so um bye bye rob <laughs> Uh, there we go. Just the two of us now, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, um, and I suppose I'm mainly known for creating portraits and um, a lot of composite work as well. And even though I do use now and again some professional models, I really like using local people. Um, I'm always in cafes or shops and asking people whether they'll model with Rob rolling his eyes that Sharon's off again. But I like having people that look slightly different from the norm in my pictures. So today, what I'm going to try and do, hopefully, if Photoshop doesn't play up, 
Um, I'm going to deconstruct an image called Framed that I'm sure a, a few people know. And it features the beautiful Amy Snedden who came here for a shoot. She only came for a few hours and I've had so many images just from that one shoot. She's really fantastic. And then the second one I'm going to do is um, how adding textures to an image can completely change the look of the image. And this will feature young Renesmee from Sanded Note. She's actually only six and had never, ever modelled in front of a camera before. But she is fantastic, as you'll see, and a real star. So I shall now share my screen and we'll go straight to Framed. There we are. So this is the um, behind the scenes uh, version. There's me in our little home studio. That's a, um, a small section of our lounge. And we normally uh, take pictures of, with the iPhone just to show how the original picture was taken. And that's the image that I'm going to deconstruct and make live for you. It's called Framed for obvious reasons. And the actual frame came from this most awful picture that we saw in a charity shop. I think it was about a fiver. So we just cut the picture out and throw it away. And then I simply asked Amy to hold the frame. I was really lucky because she came with this beautifully designed dress. And then this is the background that I decided it would go in, and it's Morton Hall, which is another lovely place to visit. The trouble with this particular hall is um, making sure that there's nobody in the image, so I had to take a few and then clone some people out to get the hall with nobody in. And this is Amy cut out. Now, I was going to cut out live, but it can take quite a long time. So I've done a Blue Peter act, and this is one I did previously. Um, but I use Topaz Remask for cutting out. I absolutely love it. It gets all the little hairs, and then you can see through netting. So I absolutely love it. They have upgraded to Topaz um, A Remask AI, I think it's called now. Um, but I've stuck with the old one that works really fine for me. Right, so what we're going to do is there's Morton Hall. And I'm going to, so you open the first image, which is Morton Hall as your background. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do Command J to duplicate the layer. And sometimes I can have lots of layers. So I'm going to call this blurred. And the reason that I blur the background slightly is um, the back, the very back of that picture wouldn't be as sharp as the very first foreground of the picture. So I like to do this in nearly all my images. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the gray, sorry, into filter and blur and Gaussian blur, not that much. I think about 10 would probably be okay. There we are. Now, if I zoom in on that picture now, you should see that the background is very blurred, but obviously the foreground is blurred and I don't particularly want that. So I'm going to add a layer mask. I'm sure you can see where my cursor is down there. And on that layer mask, I'm now going to go to the gradient tool. Make sure it's on the very first gradients because you have an option of about five. And I want it to be black to white. And then I simply draw upwards. And you'll see on this gradient tool here, if I zoom in again for you, that the back is now still blurred, but the foreground has now come back, which is exactly what I wanted. So quite happy with that. So I'm going to get Amy now. And I'm go simply going to click here on the move tool and drag Amy into this image. She's placed quite well there, actually. But I place it vaguely where I want her. And then I find the keyboard little arrows on the right-hand side are really good at just, just kind of moving her around slightly. I'll just move her up a little bit. There we are. So I'm quite happy with her there. 
So the next thing that I'm going to do now is I use um, a plugin called, um, as I'll just go to it here, Nick Collection. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Nick and Color Effects. Hopefully, yeah. And once it opens, I'm going to click here on Detail Extractor. This is my before and after. So that was before and that's after. I don't play about with any of the sliders here. I just click OK. And the reason for that, as you'll see, is Nick puts it on its own layer. So I can play about with the opacity of that. And the reason that I wanted to do this was I want Amy to ping out of this picture. I want her to be sharper, clearer, and with more contrast in her than I do Morton Hall. You'll see the difference in a minute. There we are. So if I turn that on and off, you'll see she's now jumping out of that picture. It's slightly too much. So I'm going to lower the opacity to 60% or so. Okay, Rob's just given me a note that says that you can't see Nick at all. Is that is that not happening, Paul? Can't see Paul either. Hi, Paul. Robert says that you can't see anything happening in Nick. Is that right? He's disappeared. Okay, okay, Paul. Rob just said you can't see anything happening in Nick. I'll have I'll just carry on because I can't actually hear Paul. So hopefully you'll be able to see something. Helps if I switch my microphone on, doesn't oh, it? That's well. I didn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Rob reckons you can't see anything happening in Nick. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think if um, it, it's uh, just a bit unfortunate, really, uh, to be honest, at the moment. So uh, I think if you just carry on, uh, okay. Sharon, and, and just talk through, and uh, maybe we can uh, maybe sort out some screen grabs that we can put in the comments sort yeah, of later sure. on, maybe, or something. Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll go back to it then. Okay, so the next thing is when you cut out a model and put it in, put them into a background, they very often look like they're floating, so you need to ground them to your picture. So the way that I do this is I put a new layer in, but the layer goes underneath Amy, and I call it shadow. And the way that I do this, I use a black soft brush, quite a little bit bigger, and then zoom in. Okay. So as I paint now with 100% opacity, you'll see that the shadow is going in behind the dress and behind Amy. And just paint it in where you want it to be. And then I go to filter and blur and Gaussian blur. And Gaussian blur, this probably quite a lot, you'll see as I'm moving it, how much. Okay, maybe there, okay. And if I zoom out again, what's good, that's with, and that's, there we are. But because it's on its own layer, I can lower the opacity of that shadow. And I think I like it about there, which on this is 70%. But still not finished with shadows. So I'm going to put another new, a new, another new layer on. But this time it's going above Amy. And this is called Feet Shadow. And again, I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to take a smaller brush this time, still black. And I'm going to paint this just along every edge that's touching the floor. There we are. And I'm going back again into filter and blur and Gaussian blur, but not as much this time. 
because shadows, if you study them, which we have been sad enough to do, are much stronger nearer the person. So we'll leave them about there. And again, if I zoom out, they're too much, but because they're on their own separate layer, I can lower the opacity till I'm happy with the shadows. A little bit more even, I think, there we are. So we're kind of getting there with this picture now. But what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put a new layer on called a dodge and burn layer. And I use this quite a lot. So we need a new blank layer called um, dodge and burn. And now I'm going up to edit and fill. And I'm going to fill this. You can choose all sorts of stuff here. But what you need is the 50% gray. And it completely covers the image. But don't panic, because I'm going to go here to the blending modes. And I'm going to choose soft light. And now it completely disappears. So what you do now is you dodge and burn areas in. So I use this to kind of make, make it lots of texture looks in her dress and to add light into certain areas of the picture. So the first thing we'll do is use the dodge. You need to be on mid-tones with um, an exposure of about 12% so that you can gradually paint the light in and not do it too much all at the same time. So I'd like her hand there, which is getting the light from the window and a little bit down the edge there and the same here. Now, you'll know, you won't notice an awful lot, but when I turn this on and off, you'll see exactly what I'm doing. Everywhere where her dress is showing brighter areas, I'm painting in very slowly. Now, I'd probably spend a good half hour or more doing this, um, but I'll just quickly do it for now to give the, you the idea of what I'm doing down here a little bit down here and it just if I turn it on and off can you see just very slightly bringing in the bright areas of the dress and then I go to the burn tool and I do the complete opposite so everywhere the dress has a shadow in Again, it's on mid-tones and exposure 12. It doesn't seem to work on anything except mid-tones, and it's a gentler way of doing it. So everywhere the dress has a shadow fold, I'm painting it in. If I turn all these layers off, that's what you end up with. And then I'll turn them back on again so that you can see. There we are. And as I said, I'd spend much more time doing that, um, a, pro a good half hour painting everything in. But I'm quite happy with that picture now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make an all visible layer. I'll explain this a bit further on the next one. On a Mac, it's Shift, Option, Command and E. And that's an all visible. As I said, I'll explain what an all visible layer is more in the next shoot. But basically, instead of flattening your image, it gives you an Im um, a layer that combines all the images below. If I turn off all my lights, all my eyes, I mean, you'll see there. So I take a good look at this and decide, OK, this is where I do the final tweaking. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to go back into Nick for a second. You probably won't see what's happening. But if I talk you through it, I'm going into Nick, color effects. And this time, I'm going to darken and lighten center. And this is really, really good for adding light where you want. There's a little section in it called place center and I drag the cursor just under her chin and then I can make the the light a little bit smaller and open the background it, as soon as you can't see this I won't talk about what I'm doing too much I'll just press ok so you can see the difference Nick 
Nick is quite a big plug-in and it can take a few seconds for it to uh, take effect. There we are. So can you see the difference now? It's just added light. As Robert said, I want the viewers to look at Amy's face rather than their eyes darting around the room. So I actually really like that. The only thing that I'm going to do now is I've decided, and I, I left these in on purpose, that I thought the two windows at the back are a bit distracting. So I'm going to go down here and open an adjustment layer of brightness. Just click the wrong one, so let me get rid of that. Brightness, there we are. And I'm going to, I'm just looking at the windows at the back and I'm going to lower the brightness on them until I'm happy. And I don't care about anything else in the image at the moment. Um, as you can see, the whole thing has gone black, but the, it puts a layer mask on. I'm going to invert that layer mask from a white one into a black one. So now you can't see it at all. I'm going to paint with a black brush and to change the color from black to white, you just press X. And now I'm going to paint with probably about a 40, 50% and just paint out the windows so they're not as distracting. Keep painting them out till I'm happy with them. Yeah, if I turn that on and off, you can see again, they look better like that. Okay, so I'm going to do an all visible layer again, just to finish off with a vignette. And the way that we vignette um, was a technique from Ross McKelvey that I absolutely love. And I'll just show you how you do that. Why I like it is you don't paint with black like most other vignetting. It actually uses the colors in your image and just darkens them up. So you go to the rectangular marquee tool, and you basically draw around your image as if you were putting a border around it. Then you go to select and inverse, and now you get it to look like it has a frame around it. Back to select and down to modify and feather. And you feather about 395, say okay. And then you press Command J to give yourself a new layer. And you'll see on this layer here, it's actually given me a layer just of the colors around. And now I go into adjustments to exposure and drop this to minus 1.50. That darkens it all up. And then I go to the opacity on this layer and just lower it to about 70 or so. And I think that gives a really lovely vignette to an image. So that's that image finished. Shall I go back? Hello? Okay, I'll just carry on with the next one then. I'll just open it up. Okay, so this is young Renesme, and um, I took quite a few pictures of her as the little match girl. And this was one where I just told her to blow out the match. She had great fun doing that. And I'm going to change that original image to that one, which I think looks much better, just by adding five layers, but we'll do it live so that you can see what I did. I'll just shut that one down. So this is the Renesme image, as I said, um, her mum was watching very carefully so that she didn't burn herself with a match. <laughs> so this is, um, it has been played about within Photoshop, a kind of finished image that I put to one side knowing it needed something different. So I thought um, I'd show textures because textures seem to be coming back into fashion again. Um, and a few people ask how we do it. 
So you open the image you want to play with, and then this is a texture that I made. It was an old linen skirt that I just took a picture of with an iPhone. And I'm going to simply go onto the Move tool and drag that texture image over her. It doesn't matter that it's small and doesn't fit because you can just drag it out. The only thing you have to make sure that you do is completely cover the image that you're working on. Otherwise, you'll have a little band around it that just looks silly. There we are. So it's completely covered the Renesmee image. You don't have to worry about what color your textures are. I'll just put linen texture there. Because we can change that in a minute. But now we're going back to the blend modes again. And we're going to go through them all slowly. You can see they all have a slightly different effect on the picture. There we are. But the one that I liked on this was soft light. I nearly always use overlay or soft light. Overlay is slightly stronger, but I like soft light on this image. Um, and normally I would rub the texture from her face because a woman or a little girl has beautiful soft skin. But as you can see, because she's supposed to be an urchin and look slightly mucky, I've decided to leave the linen texture in on this one. Um, the next thing that I did, oh, I know, I'll change the colour, because even though the original picture's brownish and the linen was brown, I decided I kind of would like that blue, maybe. So I'm going to change the colour of this linen texture, and that's why it doesn't matter what colour you take for your textures. So go down here, and I'm going to select Hue and Saturation. Just click that box to make sure I'm just working on the linen level. And with the Hue Saturation, can you see, you can actually make the picture any colour you like, just by moving that top slider. And I think I'd like this bluish. And then I can even bring the saturation of the blue down slightly to about there. Yeah, quite happy with that now. But then I decided I also would like um, a real grungy kind of texture over this, which, as I said, you can do. And here, oh, I should show you this one first. That's where I got the, the rust texture from. Um, that's me in the garden taking the picture on my iPhone. And it's an old tray from the oven that I'd had seen better days, really. So we just left it out in the garden to rust away. And every couple of months, go out and take a picture of it. Because um, believe you me, the rust looks different every now and again. And that's the rust texture. And again, I'm going into the Move tool, and I'm going to drag this onto my Renesmee picture. There it is. Make sure that it's covering the whole picture, as I said. OK. Now, this time, I'm going into the blending modes again and deciding which one I like. And I'll probably stick with soft light again. But it's slightly strong, so I'm going to lower the opacity of that till I'm happy with it maybe about 50% about there. But this time, I don't like that texture on her face. If I zoom in on her legs particularly, it just doesn't look good. So I'm going to put a layer mask on. And I'm going to rub paint, I should say, use a black paintbrush. Again, I'm pressing X. If you see here, it goes from black to white just by pressing X. But because it's a white layer mask, I'm using a black soft brush. And I'm going to rub it off her skin. Probably, I'll use about 90%. Just rubbing it from her face. A really good tip is to press the backwards um, icon on your keyboard. And then you can actually see where you're painting. Let's make sure that I'm just getting her skin. 
and her hands here. You don't, it doesn't matter if it leaches over very slightly, it actually helps to blend it all in. And I'm making my brush bigger and smaller by pressing the um, bracket keys on my uh, keyboard. There we are. And what's really good about this, obviously, if I make a mistake like that, I just press X to change it to a white brush and rub out the error back to black just to fill that in. And then if I press the um, backwards, there, you can see. So I, I think that looks really nice. And what, what it's done is it's added the texture to the back so it looks as if she was... Um, had a, a concrete wall or something behind her. And that's it, I think, for that one. Did we do any more on the original? We might well have. Let me just have a look. Open. Oh, yeah, I can see what I did. Right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do one of those all below layers again. And the reason that I do this at the end is because this is where you can tweak, as I said, and play about with your images. Um, and what I'm going to do here is, unfortunately, go back into Nick for a section, um, Color Effects Pro. And I'm going to do Detail Extractor. I'll just click on it and come out of it again so that you can see. It'll be really, really overpowering on the whole image. But what I wanted to do was bring out some of the light and shade in the costume that she's wearing. You could do this with the dodge and burn, but I just thought I'd show you a different technique. So that's the detail extractor. Too much, so I'm going to take the opacity down to maybe about 70%. And I'm going to put a layer mask on again. But this time, I want this layer mask, instead of it being white, I'm going to invert that layer mask by pressing Command and I. And it makes it black. So there's less painting out to do. So it basically makes it disappear. But I'm going on a brush, pressing X so that it's white. And then everywhere. I'll lower that slightly. Everywhere that's dark, I'm just going to, can you just see it's just bringing in some of the texture there. And you can emphasize everywhere that the, um, I'll just lower that down a little bit again. Everywhere where there's creases, you can just bring them out very slightly. And if I do that, you can just see what I mean. And again, like the dodge and burn, I would take quite a long time to do this. Very, very slowly bringing texture back and her eyes and her lips. There we are, finished ball. Back to you. I'll bring Rob back in as well. Oh, that was. No. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> was a show you couldn't see Nick, but at least you could see the effect at the end. Yeah, certainly could. Yeah. Oh, that was absolutely oh, amazing. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. So, I mean, I've I've been I've been living in Photoshop for like 15 years and and even I've picked up some techniques there. So, and I, I think it just goes to show as 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 well that you can uh that you can never stop learning uh yeah. when it comes to creative tools as well, doesn't it? So, having just having that mindset of of just just taking something and especially with uh you know the textures as well so just keeping your eye out for sort of yeah. any interesting textures that you see and and things like that really the and then you can add it into other things yeah the best place to get textures is being q with your iphone because they've got floor flooring they've got slate tiles cork tiles and the builders merchants, when Rob's buying lots of boring things, I'm always at the other end of the store with my iPhone because you only need iPhone images for them. You don't need a really good camera to take them. It's good. Yeah, so you can 
it's just it's just recording a texture, isn't it? And you yeah. can literally use anything uh, anything to do that. So um, we're having loads of uh, loads of lovely comments coming through. Um, so you know, uh, oh, yeah. we're having. Uh, we're having uh, so fabulous. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, brilliant, handy tips. So uh, thank you all for uh, commenting. Uh, we are watching. Uh, there were a couple of questions, but I believe you actually tackled them as you went through as as well. So uh, hopefully all the questions were sort of uh, uh, were sort of answered uh, there as well. So that's brilliant. Uh, think, thank you um, everyone for watching. Sorry, I'm just going to say. I sorry, think sorry. Robert, well, no. I think actually deconstructing framed might be on our web page so people could follow it through. I think it is uh, actually. Yeah, if you put the link to our web page, um, Paul, people can um, have a look and at that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Have you got it? That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. I'll stick it in after the live. I'll I'll put it into the comments below. Uh, that's uh, that's not a problem. So it'll be it'll be there for you. Uh, Absolutely amazing. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone, with the uh, not showing Nick. Uh, we will uh, hopefully get resolved that. And, and sorry, guys, for putting you in a uh, te technical <laughs> difficulty uh, well, section fine. anyway. But you're, you're the first on and we're live. It's what live's <laughs> about, isn't it? So uh, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, Robert, with your slideshow, it was it was brilliant, very informative of how you can work through and and really getting into the mindset of how a picture is actually put together. And Sharon, with your live demonstration in Photoshop, it was absolutely lovely. So um, we're getting loads and loads of thank yous through. So everyone's saying thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a, a great place uh yeah yeah it's it's all there uh obviously you can you, you guys can go into the comments and sort of interact afterwards if you wanted to as well so um yeah that's brilliant thank you very much for joining us um and um uh, we we will see you very very soon um uh, i'm just going to drop you guys out now thank you very much bye 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 what an amazing talk uh super amazing <laughs> i'm lost for words already um that was our first talk that we're doing with our virtual show uh thank you everyone for tuning in live if you're uh if you have been struggling watching some of the live comments um you, you can watch this video afterwards as well it will be on our facebook page and our youtube page so you'll be able to uh, watch the video back in full if you needed to go back and have a look at some of the techniques uh, that sharon and rob sort of went through you can go back and and watch the video uh, at any point on our social media platforms um later on today we've got gary jones coming in at three and then this evening we've got alan wallace coming in uh, doing a talk on astrophotography as well. So look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, but for now, cheerio. Bye-bye.